Next up on This Week in Law, we've got Snark of the legal variety, Stephen Caplet. Remember him? He wrote, oh, a little letter that you might have seen to this township attorney for the township of West Orange, New Jersey. We're going to talk a lot about that with him. We're going to talk a lot about the Jobs Act with Bill Carlton. Evan and I are here too. So amid the snark, we've got some athletic gamers and some grandmas hunting porn. I don't know. It got kind of silly on this one. You let us know what you think next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Evan Brown. Episode 222, recorded August 2, 2013. Confessed it all. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymous and unfiltered. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the code TWILL. Hi, folks. You've joined us for This Week in Law. I'm Denise Howell, and I'm so thrilled to have this panel with us today. We are going to have so much fun. We are going to be disrespectful in the politest possible way because uh, I think maybe we should call this episode of the show, Evan, really with Denise and Evan because uh, we're going we're gonna to go in for some legal snark on this episode of This Week in Law in the politest possible way, of course. Evan Brown is back with us. Hello, Evan. Hi, Denise. It's great to, great to be with you. Great to be back after being out uh, for, you know, two of the last four weeks. I feel like I'm really missing something in life. So really uh, glad to be here and looking forward to our conversation. It's great to see you again. And uh, joining us is from New Jersey, not quite West Orange, New Jersey, but nearby is Steve Caplet. Hello, Steve. Hi, Denise. Glad to be here. Great to see you, Steve. Now, Steve uh, has written a letter that maybe a lot of you watching or listening saw a few weeks back. If you haven't seen it yet, here's your little reading assignment for the beginning of the show. Uh, while I'm introducing our final panelists, go, go Google Steve Caplet and uh, West Orange and pull up the letter and give it a read. And then you'll be all ready for our discussion because we won't be able to do it justice as we discuss it. You really have to read through it yourself and then you'll know why we're so delighted to have Steve on the show. And we're also delighted to have Bill Carlton back with us. Hello, Bill. Hey, Denise. Hey, Evan. Uh, good to see you two again and good to meet Steven. Great to see you again, Bill. Bill's going to uh, bring us up to speed on the latest and greatest with the Jobs Act, which the SEC continues to make rules about. So if you are interested in funding your company and perhaps crowdfunding your company, uh, <coughs> Bill's going to have all the information that you need for that. But let's start out in the great city of West, or I guess it's a township of West Orange, New Jersey, and uh, find out why we think that Steve has written one of the greatest bits of legal writing ever. Now, I bet, Steve, you have come under some fire for this letter. Uh, for some people that didn't quite respect as much as uh, we do the humor with which it was intended. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what happened and, and the letter that you wrote? Uh, sure. And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, I would like to say it, it, it did really take me by surprise because uh, I think it was obvious to most people who read it that uh, while, while the cease and desist letter was uh, a serious letter from the township uh, to my client, Jake Freewald, um, my letter was really just intended to, to make a, a big joke out of it. I, it was not intended to be taken seriously. Uh, uh, you know, as some people did. And yeah, I, I absolutely did come under fire uh, from a very small minority. Most of them seem, frankly, to be lawyers with, uh, with a characteristic lack of sense of humor. Um, but the, the, the basic background, uh, I, I should say, I don't live in, in West Orange anymore. I'm in the town over in Livingston, and I still own a house there. But um, uh, the background is, like a lot of uh, small towns, you know, the local politics can get a little heated and acrimonious. And um, uh, I had just moved to this area in 2010, so I sort of 
got involved in the local council election, uh, volunteering for Jake, who ran for city council, uh, and lost. He was part of uh, a six-way race for four seats. And um, I, I kind of hadn't been following things since then. And uh, then in June, I heard about the cease and desist letter, and I honestly thought it was a joke. Uh, and I emailed Jake and I said, did you really get a cease and desist because of your website? And he said, I absolutely did. And he emailed it to me and uh, I was really kind of stunned. And what was shocking about it was that the letter was, was you know, completely unqualified. Uh, as, as I explained uh, to some friends who are not lawyers, it's exactly the kind of letter, if you take the names off, it's exactly the kind of letter that you would see from a large company that has very, very valuable trademarks and is constantly victimized by uh, counterfeiters. Uh, you know, it's the kind of letter you send when it's black and white uh, trademark infringement and you want to get it on the record and warn the infringer uh, so then when you take legal action uh, that, that, that has more powerful effect. Um, to see that coming from a government and whether it's the federal government, state, town, local, the government's the government, and to see that uh, from a government being sent to a private citizen uh, claiming that the, uh, the town has cornered the name West Orange or possibly the words Western Orange, uh, it, it was just so ludicrous. I, uh, you know, I freely admit I was having a slow day and just wanted to have some fun with it. So in a nutshell, what happened here is Jake, Steve's client, <clears throat> Uh, was running a little site, and one of the funniest parts of your letter, Steve, is running down your client's website and how basic it is and simple it is and the free hosting and tools that were involved in putting it together. Um, you you did nothing but uh, diss your client's site to great humorous effect. Um, and it's a collection of links about West Orange, New Jersey, and it's at the domain westorange.info. Um, West Orange itself was operating its own website. What was that domain, Steve? I, I don't recall. I believe it's westorange.org, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and and one, of the, one of the things you point out in your letter is why on earth isn't the township using westorange.gov, which it would be entitled to do, but for some reason it has issued that domain and really, really wanted apparently westorange.info or wanted... Jake to stop using that because uh, as it turns out and as unfolded in uh, council meetings after the fact here, uh, the city or the township of West Orange is tweeting at the handle West Orange Info. Um, so they are asserting that there's some confusion with this website. Uh, you did a very nice job of laying out the legal bases uh, why the township would not be entitled to extract the domain from your client. Uh, do you want to explain that for our listeners who are not lawyers? Why should <clears throat> someone who has a town's name in it be able to go ahead and keep their site? Sure. And um, I want to say up front, I, I don't specialize in either trademark or domain law. I have some experience and, and I have sort of an eclectic uh, outside general counsel practice uh, without getting uh, on a deviation about my background, I, I do mostly transactional work, um, and I definitely have trademark and domain experience, but I'm not a specialist. So I would defer to Bill and ask him to jump in with any any um, comments he would want to make. But in a nutshell, um, <clears throat> trademark law is in some sense simple and in some sense complicated. It's simple in that um, most disputes come down to whether there's what's called a reasonable likelihood of confusion. And it's, it's sort of... Uh, basic common sense. And um, if, if you see someone using a, uh, an obvious trademark, you know, the, the biggies like Coca-Cola or uh, Apple, you know, any, any of the most powerful trademarks and logos that you can think of, um, we sort of all know what it looks like uh, when someone is infringing that or copying it. Um, you know, as a footnote, uh, I've been to China um, a couple of times. The very first time I went there was in the early 90s. And the very first thing that struck me uh, first day in Beijing was just sort of this rampant, you know, almost comical trademark infringement uh, all over the place. Um, you know, things like Leo jeans instead of Lee jeans. But um, what's interesting here is that 
Um, domain names are uh, basically governed by uh, an organization called ICANN. It's the Internet, I forget the exact acronym, but it's basically the Internet uh, domain governing body. And so if someone believes that their trademark is being infringed, uh, through a domain, and there's something called cyber squatting, which basically means if you know you were to grab Coca-Cola.org, you know, 25 years ago, and it may have been available. Um, that today, I, I believe Bill would agree, is is considered cyber squatting. Um, and so, what Coca-Cola or any other company would be able to do is file what's called a UDRP, a dispute with ICANN, which is sort of this international governing body. And there would be a hearing, and if ICANN agrees that, uh, you know, the challenger has a greater right to the name because of trademark protection, they can actually pull the domain away from whoever owns it and give it to that entity. And that makes a lot of sense, and I think everyone would understand that. Uh, the interesting thing here, and I knew this, but I had to confirm it to make sure I was 100% before I, I wrote my response, um, I think the weakest possible claimant would be a government or a municipality claiming a geographic domain name, you know, and, and, and I just cited three of the cases that were in there. Uh, and I actually confirmed with some of the uh, domain lawyers that I know, I, I asked them, have, is there a single case that anyone's ever heard of where a, uh, a town or a municipality actually won a UDRP for a geographic domain? And, you know, they all sort of laughed and said, of course not. You know, how could that even be the case? Um, so even though I sort of had fun with the letter and I talked about the First Amendment and some other things, what it really boils down to is something called a UDRP. If you feel like uh, someone's using a domain that you shouldn't, you would file a dispute with ICANN, and it's very simple. You win or you lose, but ICANN decides who gets to keep domain names. Got it. So uh, it looks as though this is going to be the end of the township <clears throat> coming after your client, you haven't heard anything in response other than um, some statements at a council meeting that referenced other social media accounts using West Orange info. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I should... I, I shouldn't. I probably shouldn't make any more jokes. I, I don't know if this is the last they're going to come after him. It's probably the last they're going to come after him on this, um, mm -hmm. you know, because of the because of the website. But um, uh, I, I again, I'm not really involved in the politics there anymore. I don't live there. I don't vote there. Um, I, I did hear about the council meeting. I heard it got very acrimonious. Um, but I, I will point out one thing, and uh, I think Denise, I mentioned this to you when we spoke the other day. I, I actually, putting aside the legal issues, I mean, there was just absolutely zero legal basis to the cease and desist letter. And it's a rarity as a lawyer that you see something that is so black and white, where it's it's not like 90% versus 10. It is literally 100% guaranteed there is zero legal basis for them to have sent the cease and desist letter. But having said that, um, my reaction and Jake's reaction would have been a lot different if they had sent a letter you know, a softer letter saying, hey, look, uh, you know, you can use whatever domain you want, but, um, you know, we use West Orange Info and Twitter and we use it in some other social media. And, you know, some people could find that confusing. And by the way, Jake um, served as a member of what's called uh, the PRC, the, I think, Public Relations Commission. It's basically a volunteer commission set up by town statute in West Orange to basically you know, be the public liaison and, and tell the story of West Orange, which is a great town and, and has a lot to offer. Um, it's interesting because after the fact, uh, I could have envisioned a far more serious, softer letter that basically said, hey, you're serving on the PRC, you grab this domain name, which you're entitled to do, but we happen to use it for social media. And, um, you know, at minimum, we would ask you to put a disclaimer on your website that it's not affiliated with the town. And by the way, um, you know, you should be mindful of your responsibilities to the town as a PRC member. And if they had done that, I am 100% sure Jake would have put a disclaimer on, a website, on his website, which he did anyway, um, and, uh, you know, would have taken that at face value. So I think it's a good example of, uh, you know, what happens when you, when you actually have the basis for a reasonable request, but zero right to make a legal demand, uh, you know, it's it's important how you approach things. Yeah, definitely doing your homework is mandatory or you may risk becoming a public spectacle uh, in the way that has happened here simply because you, Steve, wrote a letter that was 
definitely worth sharing around and caused a lot of enjoyment, I think, um, to see that someone took the time to not just do a legal smackdown, but do it in such a creative way. Um, Evan, what are your thoughts on all this? Well, this is obviously a great piece of work from from this genre. And um, I suppose the, the lesson for us as lawyers on the outside looking in uh, at this is how it, it can, how disputes like this, which have a lot of factors leading up to them and which are invisible to the outside world, um, how that can um, color the approach to it and really make the, the person sending a nasty letter that like the one that precipitated this uh, kind of looks silly at the, at the end of the day. I mean, a situation like this in particular, and this is a theme I think we've talked about several times on the show, Denise, you know, local politics are especially rife with interesting, colorful issues. I mean, people really get riled up about this stuff. So clearly there are some undercurrents of local politics and personal issues and vendettas and access to grind, what have you, in all of this. So it, there's there's a lot of that underlying it here. But all we get to see, uh, you know, when we look at AboveTheLaw.com or where was some other coverage of this? I think it made it under the Huffington Post, right? This is a pretty it big, did. pretty uh, exposed uh, story here. We just get to see the end result silliness uh, of it all. So. Um, you know, th this letter that, uh, uh, that, that, that we have here is, is, is great. And, um, you know, I just, there are a few things I wanted to point out about it. I, I like the fact that uh, uh, there, it really comes in two parts. There's the, the part saying, uh, oh, yeah, obviously you're joking. So here, here is my satirical response to it as well. And then there's also, just for good measure, the, what it would have been had we really seriously responded to this. I think that's a great way to, to structure this. Uh, the first part, uh, the non-serious part, uh, you know, essentially, or well, it does say that the other side is a, a big meanie. I think that's great. Um, <laughs> it also mentions that, uh, I, I, I like in making the point that there are all these other domains out there. So show me the, the, the prank letters you've sent to the owners of all these names. I like some of the parentheticals here. You know, there's West Orange NJ. Dot net And the parenthetical says, now that sounds like a township website, poking fun at how ridiculous some local government URLs can be. And then finally, the mention of westorangemassagetherapy.com, hopefully not a euphemism, uh, suggests you investigate. So maybe this story does have a happy ending. So, you know, then oh. there's the... What? Did I... What did yeah. I say? Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then so there is... Then the serious part, you know, this is what the, the serious response would be, but I love it how it gets in, you know, halfway through it and it's, you know, citing to some cases here and then it goes on uh, instead, instead of a string citation, talk about a kajillion other court or U.S. Supreme Court free speech, free speech cases. So it's nice to see the word kajillion uh, in this as, as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, great work, Steve. Uh, good, uh, good job. And uh, uh, who's Sam Hill? By the way, I, I looked on Wikipedia. That's more out in, uh, in Bill's uh, neck of the woods, right? Sam, Sam Hill. That sounds like a Boston reference, isn't it? No, I, I think. Um, what the Sam Hill? I, yeah, I think there was. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny. I did this. I, I didn't spend quite as much time on it as you might think, because I honestly, in my naivete, didn't didn't expect this to get nearly the traction that it did. It basically was a big inside joke in West Orange. And, um, you know, the best evidence of that is the PS and the PPS, which is, you know, I think on its face, anyone would understand that was very much an inside joke. Um, yeah. But the Sam Hill reference, you know, I was, I was trying to think, uh, and I've heard that, you know, it's such an antiquated saying from like the 1920s. And I think it had something to do with uh, someone building a railroad out, out, out west and some fanciful aspirations and uh, I don't know it's, I just plugged it in there I didn't I didn't spend that much time thinking about it but it's it's sort of a uh, polite antiquated way of saying things that we would say in a more profane way today I guess we definitely need to start saying that more often I'm going to try to <laughs> bump it up in priority in my lexicon for sure yes exactly um, Denise can I make one uh, one serious point though of course um, uh, if I may, you know, I think I, I, I got literally, I, I mean, I stopped counting probably over 300 unsolicited emails, you know, from from as far away as South Africa, Ireland, Australia. It was just uh, amazing. And, um, 
You know, what's interesting is I think uh, what really resonated with people is just sort of a rare opportunity to truly have a laugh at the expense of government. Um, mm -hmm. But but there there's a serious side to it, which is, and, and I don't want to introduce politics into it because, um, you know, my views are my own views, but, but there are some very, very real, serious, intense uh, sort of, you know, uh, destiny type debates that are going on in the country now about privacy and data and drones and the NSA and was Edward Snowden a hero or a traitor? You know, th these are things that, you know, to use the old uh, legal expression uh, that reasonable people can disagree on, but they are deadly serious issues. Um, and I think one of the things that got lost here and one of the things that struck me and why I decided to have so much fun with it is, um, is uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people, uh, especially non-lawyers, I think a lot of people in America uh, view the, con and I don't want to sound preachy here, but view the Constitution almost like the Bible. You know, it, it, it has a sacredness that is unlike any document, any Constitution in any other country in the world. And, you know, the whole idea that the government can sort of, you know, tell someone to shut down a website or do other things, I think it really resonates with people because we're living in an age where, uh, you know, this show is a perfect example. We're having a show on the Internet. If someone had said that to us 20 years ago, you know, we'd say, what, what's the Internet and how can you have a show on it? Um, so, you know, there are real serious public policy issues here about the role of government and privacy and the law catching up to social media. And, you know, we want our government to protect us, but also not invade our privacy. And so without being too serious about it, I think it was, you know, looking back on it, I think it was just a neat opportunity for people, even outside the U.S., to read the letter and, you know, in, in a rare moment, have just a really, you know, good old-fashioned laugh at government uh, without it being any more serious than that. But I, I think it struck a nerve because these issues are so serious and they're so unfamiliar and they're so unprecedented. You know, how does the Constitution interact with uh, social media and things like that? Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that take on it. I hadn't really thought about the reaction stemming from uh, sort of schadenfreude about government. I really took it as people liked to see a lawyer, as particularly one who had sent, you know, the kind of demand letter that gets sent thousands of times every day that people hate to find themselves on the receiving end of, to have one of those uh, taken down in such a way, I think, made people feel great too. Um, there is another legal aspect of this. You know, it's, it's also uh, fun in the context of your letter, but I think there's a serious legal nuance of this we should try and unravel, and that is uh, the notion, the, the, the dwindling demarcation between top level domains like a dot info domain and the equally, if not often more identifying and brand associated subdomains that people acquire by using social media, whether it's a Twitter account, a Facebook account, YouTube account, whatever. Um, we talked on the show about the fellow who was doing a similarly informational Twitter feed about Sun Valley, Idaho, and had his Twitter handle taken away from him under Twitter's terms of service when Sun Valley, the resort, decided that it wanted to start using that, and that was their mark. Um, so, you know, under those circumstances, there, ICANN, which is the uh, International Corporation for Assigned Named Names and Numbers, I believe is the, the acronym there, would have nothing to do with what Twitter does under its terms of service. And when we look at what's going on just in on Twitter with West Orange, the town itself is tweeting at West Orange Info. Someone else is tweeting at West Orange Appears to be a high school student or booster from Winter Garden, Florida, where there is a West Orange High School, the Warriors. Um, so that fellow, you know, has this just plain West Orange Twitter handle. Who knows if he's been approached and asked to cough it up the way that uh, the Sun Valley guy was. But it, it gets into, you know, should we be paying attention to or requiring social media sites to behave in the way that ICANN does and try and sort these things out 
Um, or can't, you know, is that even a rational kind of approach to take? Do we have to just sort of let these private entities make their own decisions and that's going to lead to a lot of inconsistency and some chaos? What do you think about all that, Evan? Um, I mean, there's, it's, it's definitely just different contexts. And I think that because these different scenarios come from different uh, technological means, you know, the domain name system grew up, you know, I think the first domain name was registered in 1985. And, you know, it took all the way through the early 90s into the mid 90s when we had the trademark statute uh, updated with the Anti-Cyber Squatting Consumer Protection Act, and then, you know, seeing the development of jurisprudence under ICANN's UDRP, you know, either WIPO or the National Arbitration Forum, you know, that that's just one channel by which the so-called proprietary rights in uh, those uh, spaces, domain names, uh, came about. It's just a, it's been an entirely different course by which identity has come uh, into being through the use of social media, Twitter handles, uh, Facebook URLs, wh what have you. Tum you know, I guess a Tumblr URL might be a big deal uh, these days. So there's really no sense in trying to reconcile the disparity of remedies you have if you look at just the origins uh, through which these rights developed. Um, and we've got to be more concerned about the contractual understandings that we have with the service providers and other forms, if necessary, falling back on traditional forms of intellectual property, uh, unfair competition, uh, passing off, false advertisement, those types of things to, to seek mm -hmm. remedies. The reality of it is for most people who are, um, well, victimized isn't necessarily the right word, but it's what's coming to mind here. You know, who the guy like from Idaho who had his domain name taken away, the guys who, the people who, you know, run afoul of the system and find themselves at the wrong place at the wrong time, having chose the wrong name, that, that category of people here, it's usually not a situation where the resources are going to be there to go to federal court and get some a declaratory judgment or something uh, in, in this. So that makes it unfortunate um, that at the same time, it perhaps is better to serve just as a, a warning or at least a invitation to better understand the context in which we develop these proprietary rights for ourselves using a third party's platform. Yeah, and it complicates things because as Steve was saying, geographic locations um, might duplicate themselves in different places and have, you know, fairly weak trademark rights associated with them. Bill, what do you think would happen if this high school kid or fan uh, that has twitter.com slash West Orange, what do you think would happen if the town of West Orange went to Twitter and said, hey, cough it up, you know, give us his handle? What, how do you think Twitter would deal with that? Well, I hope he would have a shot in that point you just made about, you know, some place names are, are almost ubiquitous. They're probably hundreds of Springfields. I imagine there are different, you know, there's a West Orange, New Jersey. There's West Orange, Florida. There may be a few other, maybe a West Orange, California. Maybe, um, you know, his one of his defenses could be, uh, you know, this is not unique to West Orange, Florida. Um <clears throat> A, 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 a couple anecdotes that I hold out in my own uh, way of kind of keeping track of where the balances are struck. Here in the Northwest, there's a local tech reporter named Brian Westbrook, and he was an early adopter of Twitter, uh, probably one of the first 10,000, I would guess. And uh, he got the he got the uh, Twitter handle BMW at BMW. Um, BMW now has that handle. Uh, of course, that that's probably in, in from the vantage point of today, not a not a not a hard call. Um, there's another a local startup stalwart in Seattle. She's since moved to New York, actually, uh, who's a nice person. Her name is uh, Ariana and she grabbed the handle at Ariana. And, I, and I've always thought hmm. and uh, people in the circle around here have always thought there's some kind of right justice that she's hanging on to that even though there are you know there's one more famous ariana in particular that that i'm that we all speculate might covet that name but probably under the current rules as we understand it probably can't take that away um west orange is uh is 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 somewhere in be in between isn't it and it almost doesn't have to be a uh, a place name like uh 
like uh, like Chicago or or um, or Seattle. It can almost be. Um, well, no, I guess the West makes it makes it not just descriptive. Not it's not like juicy orange or <laughs> good orange. <laughs> Denise, back right. in the mid part of the last decade, didn't uh, if you did a Google search for the word Denise, weren't you the top result? So shouldn't you have a right to get at Denise on <laughs> on Twitter? I I should I should go rest that away, but that you know maybe ten years ago I could have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right. You know, before Twitter was around, sure. <laughs> and, and before Denise Richards and Charlie Sheen started, you know, oh, yeah. hitting yeah. the tabloids. Um, so Evan, I I, I guess. Uh, I'll, I'll kick this to Steve for any final thoughts before we depart the township of West Orange and go on to some of our other stories. Anything you want to wrap this up with, Steve? Oh, I, I would just say that uh, West Orange is a great town, and please don't judge it because uh, I think the township lawyer had an off day and I had a slow day, and this was just sort of a <laughs> one-off laugh. Um, but I, if before you move on, I did want to ask one question to Bill, if I can. I don't want to put him on the spot, but since, since I'm not a trademark specialist, one thing that I've always thought, and I'd be curious, uh, Bill, if you have any um, ideas on this, uh, one of the things that struck me is, you know, when you talk about geographic domain names or someone's personal name, you know, there's sort of an intrinsic uh, reaction that, well, you know, unless it's really specific, you can't um, protect a geographic domain name. But it, it, is there a distinction in the trademark case law, if you're aware of it, uh, is there a distinction between entities that have a commercial interest, uh, not not just you know uh, that they have trademark rights, but they built up a brand and it's part of their business. Is there any distinction between sort of a commercial interest versus a general interest by an individual in their own name? Because one of one of the reasons why I reacted the way I did to this is is uh, I, I you know people said cease and desist letters go out all the time and they're silly and this is the way to respond. And I told everyone who asked me, no, this is not the way to respond because most cease and desist letters have some basis. They may not be right. But when it comes from a private business, they have some basis as opposed to a government. Um, do, you, do you have any thought? I'd, I'd be curious, Bill, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I'm going to I'm going to kick the question over to Evan because he's the trademark uh, uh, specialist, not me. It does seem to me that there's a there's a doctrine, isn't there, Evan, of famous brands and and that 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 applies to a. Uh, you know, a, a, a corporation or a product or an entity and not so much, um, you know, a personal attribute so that there would be a distinction between something that, that had a, um, a corporate or commercial purpose as opposed to something that references, uh, uh, you know, like Michael Jordan or, or a, 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 a Tiger Woods or a person, however famous they, they, they might be. Right. Well, there's a lot of ways to a lot of ways to convolute the issue. I mean, we could. Uh, I think there are at least two or three issues that that rise to the top here. And trademark law, first and foremost, protects uh, use of marks in commerce. So that you know, once we go to take the analysis to that point, it it even gets murkier, perhaps, because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're providing a good and service in return for money for it to be in commerce. So a particular mm. website, I mean, I think we wouldn't be stretching reality too far to say that I have this website. It's just me writing about something that's a hobby of mine, but there, that very well may mean that I am using that moniker for that website if it's distinctive and not merely descriptive and all that. And that's kind of the other issue here, descriptiveness, uh, that I'm providing information services related to that. And that very well may be protected as a as a trademark. The other real, and I think this might be the, the real important point here, is what is the ability of a geographic designation to serve as a trademark? And generally speaking, that uh, trademark law does not afford protection to terms that are merely descriptive of the goods or services that are being provided. Uh, there has to be some kind of inherent distinctiveness that be, that comes from it either being just a made up word like Kodak or uh, arbitrary like Apple for computers. You know, Apple is a word that already exists, but it's kind of weird to if you stop and think about it from the first instance, it's weird to think about uh, Apple's or, you know, the word Apple being referred to as a computer. So that makes it very arbitrary. And then, you know, a, a mark can acquire distinctiveness over time, like waste management. 
I don't know how on earth that's a trademark, but it is, you know, it's a huge company that what do they do? They manage waste, landfills and stuff. But that over time has become distinctive, you know, that the, the public has come to uh, associate that mark with that. So that, that, that makes it difficult for geographic designators, particularly for the government to one, be using the mark in commerce because it's really just doing the government's work. And two, it's just talking about the name of the darn town. How come, how more descriptive can you be, uh, you know, when you're, when you're talking about that? So I think it's an amalgamation of all these issues that give rise to the absurdity that Steve is uh, very well articulating in an artful way in the, in the response letter. It's just, it's what strains the uh, strength of any uh, real assertion of trademark infringement or likelihood of confusion that there, there would be in the township's hastily written cease and desist letter. Denise, well, Evan, you're, maybe- you're also good at these things too, so whatever. Uh, good at writing smackdown letters. No, I haven't uh, taken t- pen to paper for that well, kind of endeavor in I'm quite some you're, time. You're good at the trademark issues as well. I'm sure you would write uh, a fabulous smackdown letter if, if put it on it. Well, it's like, I didn't want my I mean, trademark. We, we now have a very high bar to live up to. Thanks to Steve. Hey, hey Evan, maybe, uh, maybe waste management gets in there under some kind of euphemism exception because maybe the descriptor really would be trash collector. Um, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Maybe it's, you know, there's also on that spectrum, there's suggestive marks, but you know, I don't know. I think it's still getting, I think it's pretty darn descriptive. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm I'm just, I'm being facetious. Yeah, it is. It is a euphemism for sure. All right. Well, I'm going to be suggestive and, uh, pull out uh, Evan's happy endings reference from earlier. And uh, as long as we're on the topic of trademarks, um, talk about the fact that Zynga is suing a company that has made, I think it's an app called Bang With Friends, which uh, Hmm. really doesn't bear a whole lot of discussion, except for, again, kind of the humor behind it all. Of course, Words With Friends sort of shamelessly ripped off Scrabble. But but legally, you know, I mean, we've talked on the show before about how games can um, resemble one another without infringing. It's a very complicated topic. Um, but so you they're know, have, they're upset about this because it refers to guns. Is that what it is? I I, I don't know why they're upset. I haven't read the complaint, but uh, I, I think there is um, a likelihood of confusion argument that they're making between words with friends and bang with friends, bang with friends, which is uh, sort of a hookup utility, as I understand it. Um, and uh, you know, there's just we, we're gonna put our our game out there that looks a whole lot that, like this other game, but when someone names their game something that sounds a little bit like ours, we're going to sue them. That's basically wow. what's going on here. Oh, so. it's, just the, it's just a trademark issue. It's not, there's nothing about the services that they're providing. No, 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 no. I do not think guns are involved in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Bill, any thoughts on this one? Any way, shape, or form? There's an there's a, there's a entendre there, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, was, no, that was the I, most creepy laugh, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's uh, even better. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I wonder if it, the, the, in a in a corporation where leadership is changing, um, you know, the right hand doesn't necessarily need to know what the left hand is doing, or or the current administration doesn't necessarily have to own the chutzpah or the uh, the, uh, the 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 um, uh, you know the 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 kind of decisions that that were were made in the past so i don't know if that might have something to do with it you know a a, a corporation that's shuffling through management isn't necessarily going to have a, a good sense of internal irony no probably not but we'll supply it for them steve <laughs> any thoughts on this uh well just pick up on uh on what bill said um <clears throat> i've uh i've worked in law firms and government in and, and big companies and, and one small company and it it is amazing it's really true the the bigger you get and this is true for the private sector and government it's extraordinary how many times the right hand really does not know what the left hand is doing or worse has already done and um i think when you combine that with uh the trademark area uh, you know, it can make for uh, a lot of silliness. Uh, and, you know, one, one, one other thought, um, I recently uh, had involvement with a real trademark infringement case. 
uh, that involved a big company, and they probably didn't even realize that one of their subsidiaries was doing it. Um, and, you know, sent a very, I didn't do it, but the lawyers I was working with sent a very serious letter, not making a hard threat, but sort of making a mild threat saying, you know, look, you're infringing, here's all the information. Uh, if you disagree, please let us know. But um, uh, I think especially in trademarks, uh, you know, you have to be very, very careful because it's rarely cut and dry. And that's why I asked the question of Bill and Evan. Um, you know, and, and unless you see flagrant infringement, uh, even if you're in the right, you sort of have to tread carefully because it's, it's, rarely, uh, it's rarely so cut and dry. Well, this reminded me a bit of the Apple lawsuits over the prefix I, and then the suffix pod. So, it, you know, I guess if, if this is ever to be litigated on its merits, it's going to come down to whether with friends is something that you can actually trademark um, or, you know, not. We'll, we'll just have to see where this one goes. But uh, I oy vey pod was the thing that occurred to me. Um, <laughs> let's move on to uh, copyright. All right. So, um, you know, you guys, how when you go to sell a house, there are these services that are called multiple listing services that have every listing of every house in every geographical area. And they're this huge database of information as to what's for sale and for how much. And it's full of photographs. And of course, when brokers and agents they all want to be involved in these services because it's how they get the word out online about their sales. So they go ahead and they upload the photos of their clients' homes to these services and they either click through or otherwise accept the terms of service that are in operation on the MLS sites. Um, in this particular case, which was written up at uh, Eric Goldman's blog, um, there were some interesting determinations about the rights being assigned, the exclusive rights in the photographs being assigned when those agents and brokers upload the pictures. And essentially what happened here uh, is the court found there could be a legitimate exclusive assignment of rights. It didn't go too deeply into... Um, the enforceability of the terms of use or whether the formation of an agreement in the terms of use actually happened with all the legal formalities necessary. Uh, but without reaching those issues, it did go ahead and say that assuming all that was in place, uh, we think that you can exclusively assign copyrights in this way. So um, the interesting thing here is the E-Sign Act came into play. And as uh, Venkat and Professor Goldman, and let's see who wrote this up for them, Jake McGowan writing over at the Technology and Marketing blog, uh, point out, uh, it's been 15 years since we've had a definitive statement from a court that the E-Sign Act um, could transfer a copyright that the statute of frauds, which is the requirement that things be in writing, that that part of the uh, Copyright Act um, could be efficiently dealt with by the E-Sign Act. So um, that's an interesting aspect of this decision. But uh, I'm a little bit more troubled by the notion that we have this sort of not very closely examined terms of use uh, don't really put it through the rigor of making sure that we have a valid contract here and yet we're going ahead and doing an exclusive transfer of copyrights. Evan, do you think this uh, case opens the floodgates? Well, I think you and I are troubled probably about the, the same things here. I, in the abstract, I do not think we should at all be troubled. And in fact, I think the exact opposite. We should probably be encouraged that a court is saying that indeed a copyright right may be transferred effectively under the relevant uh, provision in the Copyright Act that says these things have to be in writing uh, by virtue of an electronic transaction. 
I think that we could probably sit here and uh, most reasonable people would agree from a policy standpoint that the free and unobstructed uh, alienability of copyright rights is a good thing uh, that's going to you know, further the ends of copyright law. I can create it and then I can convey that right to someone else. And that's, that, there's all kinds of reasons that that is, is a good thing. So I'm not troubled by that part of it. And I don't think I heard you say that you were troubled by that either, Denise. But what we have here in this particular situation is a certain grabbiness by the platform and its terms of service in grabbing all these rights, perhaps um, unbeknownst to its uh, users who uh, obviously didn't read these terms very well and then going and being very, um, uh, you know, s strong, very um, heavy handed in trying to enforce these rights. And this MLS company is not the first one to do this. I mean, there was some pretty well-known litigation. Uh, and when we had Venkat on the show the last time, he was talking about this case. I think he actually represented one of the parties adverse to Craigslist in the mm -hmm. Padmapper case. Right where Craigslist was just doing some really um, aggressive things against these third-party startup incumbents who were coming and scraping all the content from Craigslist, setting up their own sites with these new interfaces, allowing people to use access their con access the content that these third parties had acquired from Craigslist, and they're actually licensing that access to other parties. So, you know, from a business model perspective, you can understand why Craigslist wanted to do that if you're going to, you know, um, just uh, take it as a given that Craigslist is very conservative when it comes to protecting its its business model. So, you know, I think that's the real issue here. This is I'm kind of this is a long way or long winded way of getting around to saying that the real problem here is the sensibilities that the platform was exercising here, and that the appellate court did indeed validate. Uh, but I think we have to take the good and the bad with this, going back to the initial point that as a, as a matter of copyright policy, rights ought to be able to be transferred freely, uh, uh, you know, on the, on the, you know, in an electronic context without there literally being a piece of paper that somebody prints out and signs and, you know, mails by first class mail to the other side. I mean, isn't that anachronistic? So there's, there's, yeah. we've got to take the good and the bad, but there is a certain bad part of this to talk about for sure. Right. And the other thing to bear in mind about this case is it uh, concerned an injunction order. So as we've discussed before on the show, that's something that um, is hard to get at the beginning of a case. You have to demonstrate a strong likelihood of success uh, if you're the plaintiff and you want to stop what the defendant is doing. Uh, but it's not the final determination on the merits. So the injunction that the district court had issued is going to stand, says the Court of Appeals here. Uh, but they still are not done hashing through all these issues. And the other thing to bear in mind is it just um, applied to the photographs, not the text or the compilation itself that was being scraped together from the um, MLS data here. Bill, any thoughts about this one? Yeah, the, the um, comment that Eric Goldman made uh to and i know the piece was by jake mcgowan but in the comments either on this post or a prior one um eric had made the comment that what uh, the mls service really is doing is hacking copyright law and i appreciate what what evan was saying earlier about taking the good with the bad that um we we ought to be glad that this is not a situation where a court allowed bad facts to make bad law and you know upheld the 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 uh, the ability to assign uh copyright in a writing but the maybe sort of broadest policy point that you know here's a service that does not actually invest its own time or money into uh, sending employees out to gather photographs or to to procure really artful um, uh, photographs, but instead uh, leveraging the fact that uh, that independent uh, realtors are just kind of taking snapshots with their phones probably and 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 loading them and just kind of having a little gotcha in the terms of service that 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 isn't really um, uh, a, a you know a programmatic uh, uh, policy of IP collection for any reason other than to have a uh, leg to stand on to use copyright to shut down people that are scraping and to shut down competitive uses of their information. I mean, we could we could agree or disagree on whether whether they ought to be able to uh, protect their aggregation, but I like that metaphor that um, you know in this particular case. 
um, the uh, the copyright assertions are essentially a hack for a, for a, an anti-competitive kind of uh, uh, agenda that the that right. the services have. Yeah, that's that can be the only reason why they feel they need an exclusive license. Uh, Steve, you want to weigh in on this one? Uh, just just one comment. I, I perked up because I actually had my house on the market uh, until recently. Uh, we, we have it up for rental or, and sale and uh, we're renting it. But um, so I was keenly interested to hear about uh, anything involving M MLS. But uh, I think Bill made an interesting point. You know, w we need copyright law because like all IP, it's it's the value. Um, the problem is when uh, IP law in general is used really for anti-competitive purposes. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, you know, I think a lot of people are aware of what submarine patents are. In, in, in a nutshell, uh, there are these entities, and, and Bill or Evan may, may know a lot more about it than I do, but basically entities that go by sort of dormant patents and wait for someone to do something creative and inventive and then pop up five years later and you know, file this big infringement suit. Um, so again, it's another example of um, you know a real tension between you know the desire to, to respect legitimate IP rights um, versus the ability of sophisticated players to use it as a weapon to basically shut down competitors. And and there's a broader point, which is I, I think copyright law in general is going to have to catch up to the internet. Um, because, you know, in the good old-fashioned days, copying meant literally making a Xerox copy of something, um, and now everything is all over the Internet. When, when my letter got around, one of, the, one of the requests that I got was from uh, uh, a state bar newsletter uh, that called and asked for my permission to reprint the letter. Uh, they were doing a story about it. And, you know, again, maybe uh, it's just like the funny season, but I didn't think they were serious. I said, you're asking my permission to reproduce my letter that, you know, was spun up all over the Internet. And, uh, you know, this was illegal. You know, it was a bar association. And they said, well, it's our policy. We just need you to sign a consent. And, of course, I did it. But um, it would never have occurred to me that I have any copyright interests in, in the letter that, that my client posted on his Facebook page. So I think it, the, the point basically is copyright law has got to catch up to the Internet. It's funny that we would sit here and poke fun at the one entity that was actually doing the right thing, so to speak, by <laughs> right. calling and getting your Exactly. <laughs> and I think technically, I mean, what do you guys think? I think he has a copyright. Oh, absolutely. This isn't, this isn't a piece of law. We're gonna get we're gonna get to copyrights in actual, um, you know, enforceable law in a little bit later in the show. But this this is I think hits all the so so wait uh, requirements Evan, of something. That he's... Evan, you're saying I should have demanded money from them. I I, I caved in too soon. Well, if you want to make a you know a goofy business decision, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you well, know so that. There's no question that you would own the copyright, and it's it's clearly yeah. a creative work. It, I mean, it's about a thousand notches above the lowest level of originality that's required for there to be a copyrightable interest here. And unless, and I, there's probably never been a, an attorney-client engagement agreement in the history of the world that says this, but unless your uh, uh, engagement agreement with your client said that you know the work product is a work made for hire and that you're assigning it the copyright interest to your client who's commissioned you to do it, uh, you won't, you would own the copyright. And, uh, sure. Oh, that's, I was just going to ask you that, Evan, if it, if the work for hire doctrine would mean it belonged to a client, but, but then the attorney's not typically an employee of the client. It's a, it's an independent contract right. relationship. Only, Probably only if the engagement agreement, assignment. yeah, only if the yeah. engagement agreement, uh, said in, you know, in writing that the copyright is hereby assigned. To the to the client, mm -hmm. would the client own the copyright in that? Makes for some, for some really interesting situations where uh, an attorney will, you know, draft a contract like an online terms of service or a privacy policy for a client, and then oh, uh, a few months later, you see a competitor who has just copied and pasted the user, uh, the the client's uh, terms of service and privacy policy on their own site. Who has the cause of action for infringement there? It's probably mm -hmm. not your client. So it's, it's an area that you got to tread uh, delicately in in those situations because you know most lawyers don't want to assign the copyright in their work product to uh their client because you know here's a big secret for all the non-lawyers out there lawyers like to reuse content <laughs> so you know you don't want to assign the 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 content uh to to one client because then that client would have the right to exclude you from using that same thing with uh, your other clients 
That's right. There's yeah. an eight scale and then there's form files. And probably the latter is what we retrade mostly. For sure. Um, yeah. And I, I think that that's a really good point, Evan, about at least thinking on the front end or maybe as the attorney and client relationship goes along as to who does own the copyright. And maybe there should be um, some sort of uh, express statement between the attorney and client about that. We'll go ahead and make assignment our first MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law because... Guess what? Every now and then in the show, we come up with something that attorneys can actually put to use in their practice, uh, whether it's keeping you up to speed on the latest developments in cutting edge case law or things like thinking about who owns the copyright in your works. Uh, we think there's educational value buried in our show here. And if you do too, then head on over to our wiki at wiki.twit.tv, uh, find the page for Twill. And there's lots of information there about getting continuing legal education credit for the show. People do it in other industries as well. So we put these phrases in the show in case you need to demonstrate to some review board that you actually listened to the show. Uh, well, we know that Steve knows all about the Streisand effect. A company called Rotolite is learning about it in the copyright context too. And we were just talking about um, co copyright being used to prevent competition. In other contexts, it can be used to limit speech and journalism and comment. And that seems to be what happened here. Uh, we have an a uh, filmmaker named Dan Lenny, uh, who runs something called the F-Stop Academy and does reviews of things like cameras and lighting, et cetera. And he did a side-by-side -side review of a couple of different lights, one from Rotolite Unlimited. He didn't like the Rotolite light much at all, did a pretty negative review. And Rotolite got rid of it on Vimeo by sending a DMCA takedown. Um, so now this is kind of blown up and... I think the um, video is available uh, elsewhere and folks now know about it. Folks like us know about it who otherwise never would have. Uh, apparently, Rotolite posted an apology about all this to Facebook and then took it down. And um, so they're kind of grappling with, oops, you know, maybe we shouldn't have used the DMCA that way uh, because aside from just having this blow up on them, of course, under Section 512F, as we've discussed here before, you uh, are not allowed to knowingly materious, materially misrepresent the fact that you have a copyright claim in uh, sending a takedown notice like this. I don't know if Rotolite is actually bright enough to have realized uh, uh. that they were <laughs> misrepresenting their copyright claim. I think they just knew they had a tool at their disposal uh, that could take down this negative review and they fired off with it. Evan, do you think that they this might come back to bite them? I thought you were going to say they're awfully dim and they wouldn't <laughs> know any, any difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, again, this, I think this is, it's, it's kind of a weird coincidence. We're having two scenarios in a row here where we're poking fun at the uh, entity that actually tried to do the right thing. Sure, they screwed up by making the initial decision to send this DMCA takedown notice, but isn't kind of what's really drawn our attention to this is the fact that they apologized for it later. They realized the error of their way, and now they're seeking repentance and by implication, our forgiveness, or not necessarily ours, they don't probably give a darn about what we think, but, you know, at the same time, recognizing that, oh, you know, we really, you know, admitting the fact that the reason that they sent the, the takedown notice to Vimeo is because they were upset from a commercial context. So, you know, I, maybe we should sit back and let them, uh, you know, figure out what, what happened in the situation, see if there's any learning experience to be, to be gained from it. Because otherwise the pattern is exactly the same of, I mean, it's really pure and simple copyright misuse, which is what Section 512F is supposed to provide a remedy for, despite the case law that um, has come down in the past few years that makes that remedy essentially unavailable. But, um, you know, the, they were trying to do the right thing, at least after realizing it, uh, what, what went wrong here. It seems like it, I guess. Yeah. What do you think, Bill? Um, I just try to come up with a joke. How many rotolites does it take? to screw up a DMCA claim. <laughs> <laughs> Just one in this instance. <laughs> Just, one, Just one, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, well, uh, folks did want us to um, feature this on the show and we have done so. I don't know that there's much more to say here. I mean, the Rotolite definitely has some exposure under Section 512F, but someone would have to establish that they knew that they didn't have a valid co copyright claim when, um, when they sent off their notice and... I don't know if their admission would amount to that or not. Uh, Steve, do you have any thoughts? Uh, just, just a general thought, um, which is it's, it's another good example. One of the emails that I got, uh, it was in response to the cease and desist response that I said uh, sent was um, from a uh, former municipal lawyer in Florida. <clears throat> and I felt like he read my mind because he talked about how you know, the, one of the most important roles of a lawyer is to be an advisor and tell your client when they're wrong or they have no basis for their position or what they want to do. I mean, several times in my career, I've, I've been general counsel at two companies, and uh, several times I've been told, hey, we've got this problem, just write a threatening letter. And I don't do that. And I'm not, I'm not being, you know, holier than thou, but, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I prefer to stick to the facts and the law like we were taught in law school. And if you have a well-grounded position, you send a letter, and uh, if there are factual disputes, you argue the facts in your favor. And if there's ambiguity in the law, you argue the law. But um, I've always felt my whole career that before you send a letter, um, you better be awfully confident uh, that you can back up what you're saying. I don't like sending letters threatening to sue if my client isn't serious. In fact, I've advised clients who are serious, let me just file a complaint rather than send a letter. Um, so I, th I think it's just sort of, of a much broader piece with, you know, how some people uh, get frustrated with lawyers because some of them, you know, will just send off threatening letters uh, without, you know, really researching uh, the basis of, of what they're saying. So I, I just think it's another good cautionary tale, uh, both for lawyers and, and clients, uh, you know, to be very careful uh, as to the position that you take and, and what you demand of others, um, uh, you know, without carefully uh, researching it and thinking through. Uh, if it's if it's uh, well grounded or not. Good points. Hey, let's look at a couple of stories on the entertainment front. All right. So when we wrap the show today, that will be the current deadline for the dispute between CBS, Time Warner. Uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern, I believe they've said they will um, either conclude their talks or grant themselves another extension to conclude their talks. Uh, but what's going on here is basically a fee dispute between CBS and Time Warner. Neither side is giving any of the details, but according to the LA Times this morning, media analysts and insiders say CBS is seeking to increase the fee that Time Warner pays to carry its TV stations, including KCBS TV Channel 2 in Los Angeles, to close to $2 a month per subscriber, and that's just for the first year. Fees would go up over the life of the contract. And right now, Time Warner is paying less than a dollar per su subscriber per month. Uh, and the cable company has said it's willing to pay more for CBS, but thinks the price on the table is too high. So right now they're at a standoff and it's up in the air still whether uh, Time Warner is going to continue carrying these CBS channels. And also on the table here is Showtime, the movie channel, Flix, and the Smithsonian channel. So... Uh, just something to keep an eye on. We don't know the answer yet, uh, how this dispute is going to come down. But this this is not an uncommon event uh, when it comes to these retransmission fees, is it, Evan? No, I mean, these things have to be renegotiated from time to time. And, and on the topic of negotiation, I mean, this particular one right here is, um, I think, going to be a good uh, example for me to give uh, to my, to my students, I teach a, a course on negotiations at Chicago Kent Law School, and I'm always looking for modern uh, contexts and scenarios for different styles of negotiation. And it really appears that, at least on the outer level here, that this is a pretty competitive sort of, of negotiation with uh, Time Warner pulling channels, uh, saying that's having to pay so much. I mean, that's a pretty drastic measure uh, to do uh, in this type of situation. So to me, the most interesting things uh, going on in this scenario are the the ways, the methods, uh, the strategies, and and it would be interesting to know more about the style 
of uh, negotiation that's that's going on in this. So this really is a, a deal making story in my book. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Bill, you're you're involved in some deal making in your practice. Any thoughts about uh, the tactics here? Uh, the uh, the the tactics seem to not account for. Um, you know, to maybe those of us that would kind of have a consumer perspective, it seems like the the negotiators feel like they're negotiating in a vacuum and they're they're leaving their their customers kind of in the lurch. So I, I don't I don't know when we hear about these uh, showdowns, uh, these face offs between uh, broadcast companies and media companies and fights over football games. Uh, I guess people think consumers have a short memory and aren't going to hold it, you know, hold the bad, have a bad taste in their mouth when they're, when their favorite shows or their events are kind of shut off. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I remember once when uh, I used to be a big baseball fan and then, and, um, and went to a lot of baseball games, but there was one strike too many for me. And, and, um, um, you know, I don't, I don't go anymore when they, when they canceled half a season, once I haven't really returned. I don't, I don't, I, when I moved recently and I didn't, I didn't renew cable TV. And so now I'm just trying to sort of go all, you know, over the, um, over the internet and on, 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 uh, on from streaming services. Um, but I can't, I can't say that disputes between, um, c cable companies and, uh, and, uh, broadcast networks, uh, prompt prompted that, but it doesn't seem to me like the, uh, like the uh, the participants are thinking in terms of the fallout, uh, you know, in their goodwill with the with the consumers or their subscribers at the end. Well, you raise a really good point, Bill, and I think that it's people like you, whether or not you were prompted by these disputes to to take the step that you did and cut off your cable service, but it's people like you that give the CBSs of the world better bargaining position in these disputes because they're more able to go to the cable companies and say, hey, you know, we've needed you for a really, really long time. We need you less now. We have other ways to distribute our content. And really, if you're gonna uh, hold us to it, maybe we'll give that a try. I Do I really think that's what's gonna happen here? No, but I think it gives yeah. them some leverage. Uh, what do you think, Steve? Uh, Denise, you said uh, almost verbatim what I was going to say. I, I, mm -hmm. I just heard about this story last week, and, and I haven't followed it closely, but it certainly seems that CBS uh, has far greater leverage here for the reasons that you said. Uh, the only comment I was going to make is, um, you know, like like uh, uh, much else, it's, it's just about money, and in that sense, it's very simple. And I tell clients often, uh, in both litigation and transactional, scenarios where we, you know, come to an impasse that, uh, you know, it's not complicated. It's a question of, uh, you know, which parties have more leverage, who wants the deal or the settlement more. And, uh, you know, in, uh, in virtually everything I've ever been involved in, uh, eventually someone blinks. Um, and I'm sure this will happen here probably sooner rather than later. But, uh, Denise, I agree with you. It, it, it's a very interesting example of the tables really turning on the cable uh, providers for a whole variety of reasons, and I would I would second um, what Bill said. I, I may I may go into relapse, but when we moved, uh, we didn't renew cable because I wanted to see if we can get along without it. And my uh, my children are about to uh, uh, revolt violently, <laughs> so we probably we probably are not a good example of uh, cutting the cable. Um, but uh, but I agree with you, Denise. It's a, it's yeah. a very interesting example of the leverage uh, really changing um, because of the internet and social media. And or somebody's have, gonna, oh, go ahead, Denise. I was gonna say, you should have my kid. He, he would have no problem because he really doesn't need the cable offerings because he you know, has found ways to get exactly what he wants to watch from other sources and usually commercial free. So it's, it, he actually likes it better. Um, the only reason we still have cable is because of the sports my husband likes to watch. What were you going to say, Evan? I was going to borrow the expression that they talk about with banks here. I mean, this type of situation, even still with the other leverage that CBS has through other distribution channels other than, than cable, this is a situation where the parties are too big to fail. That's the expression I was going to borrow from the banks here. So somebody is going to have to blink on this. I, d I don't know that it'll necessarily be blinking as a sign of weakness and giving in, but there's got to be some thing here because I just can't imagine a world yet where uh, Time Warner's cable offerings will be without CBS. Doesn't that just seem a little bit too soon for that? You know, give that another 
10 years uh, at least for the for the world to change on that. So despite the the leverage and the and the the strength of the positions and the 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 um, the greed, if you will, there's got to be uh, something that will that will happen here shortly. Okay, from a story about tactics to one about strategy, Evan, and and strategy's gone bad. Uh, the latest in the Prenda saga involved uh, hitting one of the uh, Prenda clients with more than twenty thousand dollars in fees and costs. Correct. Yeah, you know this is this is weird. I'm used to when I would blog about uh, Prenda and BitTorrent and stuff. The, the blog posts would get uh, uh, you know tweeted a lot, and and it's so weird that uh, I posted this and I've gotten like one retweet. So maybe I uh, you know posted <laughs> it at like, the wrong time. But oh, again, um, yeah. So the, the you know Prenda law. This is this is the infamous BitTorrent uh, copyright trolls. John Steele, uh, Paul Hansmeyer, or, or Paul Duffy. Uh, What's Hansmeyer's first name? Uh, anyway, you know that that whole outfit um, that's going around suing people, uh, John Doe's for for BitTorrent infringement. They they lost pretty big time in California, and uh, they what they did was they withdrew their complaint with prejudice, and so then the defendant went uh, back to court and said, "Hey, pay me my attorney's fees under the Copyright Act." And uh, the court uh, sided with the defendant in a pretty big way here. It ordered the it ordered Prenda's client AF Holdings, which I think, as we have learned through a lot of investigative journalism and some of the active litigation, which is uh, pretty much the same as Prenda Law. I think that's what we've what we've discovered. AF Holdings is kind of a shell company that that. Uh, a lot of the Prenda lawyers have, have been involved with here. Um, you know, the, the court ordered uh, AF Holdings to to pay 20 grand in court costs and attorney's fees to the defendant here. And they went through a bunch of different factors here that, that weighed in the defendant's favor. And probably the most interesting uh, excerpt from that is how the court found that the, that the plaintiff's case was frivolous and objectively unreasonable. So how uh, fun is for um, you know people who've been victimized by Prenda to hear a court say that the, these lawsuits are frivolous and objectively objectively unreasonable. It echoes the sentiments that we've been kicking around for the last three or four years, for as long as we've been seeing these cases. So you know the plaintiff, you know the, the court found that the plaintiff didn't do a proper investigation of figuring out whether the actual John Doe was the one living in the house who did the infringement. They just said, well, you know, he's like a guy. And he's about that age and he knows a lot about computers. So obviously it was him looking for the porn, right? It couldn't have been the grandma or whatever living in the house. So, you know, well, maybe that maybe Prenda was right in that in that situation. But, you know, the, and another important point in here was the court said that we've got to um, award these costs and attorney's fees uh, because um, – of to deter other copyright trolls from doing something like this. So, so this was an unequivocal loss for Prenda, which uh, you know always gives us a, a lot of delight to to see. And uh, you know, it got uh, it got smacked with uh, having to pay the 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 other side's uh, costs and attorneys' fees to the tune of around twenty grand uh, on this. Well, what do they call Fifty Shades of Grey? Mommy porn, right? So maybe there's a flavor of grandma porn out there that we're not <laughs> oh, <laughs> terribly familiar with. Um, but I, I know exactly why your post didn't get a whole lot more play. And that's because although over $20,000 is a lot of money for an award of fees and costs in a copyright case, it's still not the $81,000 that were awarded earlier. And this particular order, correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, was not replete with Star Trek references. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. This was more just like a real <laughs> copyright law decision. So not, uh, no, no, you know, obvious, uh, you know, uh, you know, awesome reading like that, but you know, still a lot, of, a lot of money more than, you know, yeah. if somebody wrote me a check for 20 grand, I wouldn't let it, you know, fly out the car window when I got it. Right. No, hopefully not. Um, okay, let's take a break here for a moment from the great conversation that we're having with Steve Caplet from New Jersey, Bill Carlton, and Evan Brown. Uh, we're chatting about the latest and greatest in internet and technology law, and we're doing that through the good graces of ProXPN, which is a global virtual private network that works with almost any internet connection and creates a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Any online application can work with ProXPN, including your web browser, email, file sharing, and instant messaging programs. ProXPN 
keeps everything you do online pr hidden from prying eyes, disguising your physical location and giving you unfettered access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or travel to. So uh, on last week's show, when we thanked ProXPN for its sponsorship. I uh, put out a call to our IRC and our listeners and viewers to uh, because we'd been talking substantively about the UK internet filtering that's going to be on by default at the ISP level. And I was wondering, you know, it, it was my assumption that using ProXPN would be able to uh, subvert that kind of filtering. And indeed, that's what I'm getting back um, from the folks who listen and watch and my co-host here at TWIT, Father Robert Balliser, Padre SJ. Uh, first, we got an email from viewer John who says, VPNs hide the content you send and receive from prying eyes such as your ISP by encrypting that content. Anyone examining your internet traffic merely sees random blobs of bytes. So you can't, and they cannot filter based on content categorizations like adult or hate or things like that. Someone using ProXPN in England thus would not be subject to the government's mandatory filtering by their ISP. But eventually your traffic must be unencrypted because that's how the interweb operates. Your traffic is unencrypted by ProXPN servers. So if someone wanted to monitor traffic coming out upstream of ProXPN, they would... Uh, see exactly what you were doing. It would take an examination of the internal connection records from you to the ProXPN servers to weed out all ProXPN customer traffic and tie your traffic to you, but it could technically be done. So there's our explanation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the filtering in England. And Father Robert goes on to say, would the UK go to the extraordinary step of killing all VPN tunnels no, but he goes out to point out too that they've played with products that don't look at ports or protocols, but at behavior. So we, you know, our, our consensus here uh, from putting out our call last week is that ProXPN is going to be a good solution for you if you are uh, in England and concerned about being filtered by your ISP and not wanting to come out and say, hey, I'd like to be one of the people who gets porn. So um, <laughs> if that's a concern for you, ProXPN would be a great thing to look into. It has complete online privacy through a 512-bit encryption tunnel. It works over OpenVPN or PPTP. You get to choose which one. You protect yourself against your, ISP as, your ISP's six strikes rule. Another thing where, you know, perhaps you don't want to get swept up into an administrative process simply because of the volume of traffic on your connection. Uh, you keep your personal internet usage private at work. You can bypass internet filtering and blocked websites, as we discussed. You can bypass geographical restrictions for internet content and online video with worldwide servers in the US, UK, Asia, and more. It makes your internet connection region free. It has software for Windows and Mac offering advanced controls, allowing you to select the programs and ports you want to anonymously route through ProXPN servers. It also works with your iOS or Android device, allowing you to use your data plan or public or corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy on the go. There's no app required. There's world-class customer support. If you want more information, go check out uh, Security Now 400, where Steve Gibson talked about ProXPN in detail. And also go over to proxpn.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are usually $9.95 a month or $74.95 for the year, but we've got a special offer. If you use the code TWIL, T-W-I-L, you'll receive 20% off the lifetime of your account. That's less than $5 a month on the yearly plan. If you're not if you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So go to proxpn.com slash twit and sign in with the code TWIL, T-W-I-L. Thank you so much, ProXPN, for your support of This Week in Law. All righty, let us look at a fun patent story. A what? A fun patent story? A fun patent story. I know we don't get too many of those, and I yeah, need let's either... Uh, let's see who put this in here. Uh, someone has sort of taken a mashup of two of our pet prod, uh, topics, patents and 3D printing, and is... Um, making 3D CAD files of ancient patent drawings so that this the- This is fun. Yeah, this yeah, is fun. The, 
The long gone patented device can be reproduced in all its 3D glory. Um, who put this in the rundown? It was not me. I put it up there this morning, Denise. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, uh, tell us more about this then. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was awesome to see this uh, this piece in the New York Times Bits blog this morning, and the Bits blog is just kind of doing us all the favor of calling out a project that a um, uh, a um, lawyer in New York. It, the article identifies him as 31 year old Martin Galise, who's a patent litigation lawyer. And I guess somebody at Bits Blog figured out that that Martin has a blog at which he is uh, uh, slowly, it sounds like, bit by bit, finding old engravings in patent applications from the 19th century. Um, you know, one is a uh, one is a um, a stovepipe screw, one is a flower stand, one is a some kind of a pot scraper. And these engravings are so intricate and uh, beautiful and finely done that uh, he's he's resuscitating them, bringing them forward, uh, digitizing um, uh, the designs. And Denise, as you said, uh, queuing them up to be um, usable uh, as as designs, as instructions for 3D printers to uh, to print stuff out. And I I thought the the the, the piece was really good. There's a um, here's here's a quote from the the article. If you look at the figures and older patents, the 19th century patents are really beautiful. They're really works of art," said Mr. Galise. Um, uh, the images on the uh, the New York Times has a nice graphic uh, on on their site that it looks to me like it's an original. Uh, um, graphic that they produced for the post where they they reproduce the 19th century engrave, engraved engraving from an old patent and then they have a kind of a slide overlay that shows um, um, you know how that that 19th century engraving gets um, translated for purposes of being a, a 3d design it um, almost looks like a re the top one looks like a really interesting shower head but I think oh, it was yeah, supposed they, to it's be a flower a, stand. <laughs> it's supposed to be a flower stand. Well, that could yeah. be a great flower stand too. I would like to make yeah, an arrangement with that. And the pot scraper down below. I mean, who doesn't want their own pot scraper? <laughs> yeah, especially yeah. you know college students. Yes. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> what indeed? What well, thank you, thank you for putting that in. Sure. Sure. Yeah, this is great because, I mean, it really is, it really shows us how technology is progressive. Uh, you know, the, the human brain hasn't evolved in notable ways since the 19th century. You know, we're not inherently smarter since we were, or, you know, than what we were then, I guess. I'm just assuming from based on what I know about the pace of evolutionary progress. But isn't it great to see technology building on technology, these uses of modern uh, forms of ingenuity to bring to life uh, older forms of ingenuity uh, like this. So I just think it's it's great to see that um, mashup and that 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 contrast. But yet it's a really uh, nice uh, uh, mixture amalgamation of the of the two forms of technology. The old technology put down in engravings, and the new ones brought to life with uh, with digital technology. It's a real nice uh, testament to that. Yep. Steve, any thoughts? No, I, I hadn't heard about this. I think it's uh, I think it's phenomenal, and um, you know, of course, what comes to mind is who's going to think of a way to sue this guy for some sort of copyright or patent infringement, uh, <laughs> you know, for doing something creative. Um, but um, <clears throat> I think uh, I don't know what you call this field, uh, but what it reminds me of is uh, I forgot the name of it, but there's a really neat project that I read about, and I'm I'm a native New Yorker, so this uh, really struck a chord with me. That it reminds me of a project where they recreated uh, in fine detail what Manhattan looked like, uh, you know, 600 years ago before Europeans first arrived. And it's not just sort of a fanciful imaginal, uh, imaginary uh, rendition. They, they, you know, comb the data uh, to come up with as accurate uh, a computer simulation as possible uh, to show, you know, where every brook was, every stream, every marsh. And so it, it kind of reminds me of that, you know, the fact that this uh, patent litigator um, took it upon himself to comb through and bring these things literally back to life. It's, it's sort of like Jurassic Park without any of the danger. <laughs> yeah, well, speaking like that. of that, I saw today that they're they're really seriously uh, getting to the point where they might be able to bring to life uh, woolly mammoth. 
that's that's been in the news recently. So they're like really on the verge of doing that. So speaking of Jurassic Park is what I was making the reference to. Yeah. And then let's bring the saber-toothed tigers back too, and we'll really have something going on. <laughs> well, I, mean, the, the, I don't know. I know we're not here to talk about bioethics, but who would they breed with? You know, it's just going to talk about monoculture. You'd have an inbred uh, society of saber-toothed tigers in a little bit later. Anyway, never mind. Yeah, not, no, that is not, that's a problem. They're going to have to have two different sources of DNA, right, so that they're not. Breeding yeah. with their brother. Uh, boy, okay. Boy, did I take us off on a tangent, huh? Yeah, you did. <laughs> right <laughs> down the rat hole. Uh, and and as long as we're going down a rat hole, you know, let's let's head on over to Washington where they do that quite frequently and look at some stories on the legislation and policy front. And do it in a funky way. <laughs> That's the sound of woolly mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> Clomping through the marble halls of justice. Yes. All right. Uh, so just quickly wanted to point out an interesting development regarding pro gamers getting U.S. work visas as athletes. These are called P1A visas, and they're usually reserved for professional athletes. But uh, right now we've got uh, these P1 visas being issued to um, the League of Legends Season 3 World Championship, a league based on a, a battlefield video game taking place in LA. And... Uh, the league has had to win visas for its players uh, to come and play in this event. So I um, thought that was just an interesting policy interpretation of the term professional athlete and the granting of visas. Uh, Bill, you want to weigh in on this? Well, you know, I, I think I think it's 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 easy to make fun of this, but there are. You know there are there are competitive injuries that professional gamers can sustain. You know carpal <laughs> carpal tunnel syndrome is you know is a, is a real problem, and then you get blood circulation issues. Just as anybody that's you may not be a professional gamer, but if you've taken a you know a trip in coach class across the Pacific or something, you know if you're not able to get up and stretch a little bit, that can be that can cause serious injury. If you're if you're involved in a long game and you're sitting on the couch for <laughs> for uh, you know ten hours at a time. So uh, they may they may not be as as uh, they may not be as uh, physically fit as uh, most professional athletes, but I I do think there are stresses on the you know on the body that uh, that definitely come with being a committed professional gamer. There you go. All right. So maybe the touchstone is if you can really mess yourself up in whatever sport that you're participating in, uh, mass quantities of Mountain Dew can be. Equated to an ACL tear. <laughs> All right, let's move on from this. It's kind of a silly story, but I thought people would be interested. Uh, and uh, talk about, I, I referred to just real quickly, since we've been talking to uh, talking about um, good responses to demand letters, Carl Malamud had one himself. He probably could have used your help a little bit, Steve, on the polishing, fine-tuning, and definitely the humor aspect of uh, responding to the state of Georgia. Uh, Carl Malamud is someone we've talked about on the show before. He runs the site publicresource.org, public.resource.org. And the goal of that site is to put as much law that is publicly available online so that people can both search it and do interesting, innovative things to it to be able to search it and, and go through it better. Um, so the state of Georgia has a set of annotated codes. That's the statutory law of the state that is published by the state itself. It is the only definitive official version of its state codes. Uh, but because of the annotations, they have come to Carl and said, we don't want the annotated codes on your site. We have a copyright interest that relates to the annotations. There are other sources that I guess they're saying that you could um, get the official codes themselves without the annotations. Carl has written a nice response saying how, look, if the state is putting out a code that has official annotations, those are actually part of the law and we need that too. So um, he's having a dispute there. He also points out that the state of Oregon went back and forth with him 
about this kind of thing and actually put it to the voters and said, look, do you want public.resource.org to be able to have our statutes? And the voters said yes. And so they went ahead and retracted any copyright claim they might've had. Um, So we don't know what's gonna happen with this, but uh, yet another interesting response to a demand letter. Steve, you gonna go volunteer to help out Mr. Malamud? (laughs) <laughs> well, if, if he wants some help, sure. You know, one thing that, that it brings to mind, and I, I wanted to brush up on this before the show, and I didn't get a chance, when um, I did a stint uh, at USAID, the Agency for International Development, which is uh, basically under the State Department, and worked on an interesting project, although for the life of me, I can't remember, you know, exactly how it ended up, but worked on an interesting project involving both trademark and copyright issues. And um, I remember, Evan or Bill may know this better than I do, but I I believe there was some issue where, uh, I don't know whether the U.S. government cannot own a copyright uh, or a trademark or there are restrictions, but basically, um, you know, the whole idea of a state, you know, uh, 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 even implying that they have a copyright interest in prohibiting someone from putting the law on a website, you know, it's it's just another example where, unfortunately, I think sometimes people in government um, just sort of lose sight, uh, or people working with government, you know, lose sight of of some basic common sense. Uh, so, uh, I yeah, sure, if he wants my <laughs> my help, but he sounds like he's doing pretty well on his own. He does do pretty well on his own, but uh, definitely no anybody in his situation could benefit from your help, Steve. Um, let's make jobs our second MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law. And let's hear from Bill on the latest from the SEC about the Jobs Act. What do we need to know, Bill? Well, uh, for a long time, um, there's been a debate in the uh, among uh, securities lawyers that that uh, when you're raising money from angel investors, this comes up with the SEC every year in a small business forum they have. Uh, when you're raising money from angel investors, there's a there's a prohibition traditionally against general solicitation, general advertising. What that means is, and everybody that's uh, raised money for a startup company will will know this, that it's not a public offering, it's a private offering. And in order to have the exemption from the SEC to not get in trouble for selling unregistered securities, you have to make sure that you that you don't generally solicit and you don't generally advertise your offering and that you uh, you you deal with accredited investors with whom you have a pre-existing business relationship a theory has been floating around for a long time that um, you know as long as the investors are accredited at the purchasing end what does it matter that they really how they, whether or not they hear about it through advertising or general solicitation or not if you if you police who is allowed to purchase does it really matter how the information is disseminated? Uh, practice has 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 uh, divorced itself from uh, the rules over the last five or ten years, and every year that accelerates. What with Twitter and social media sites and blogging and and uh, and now the proliferation of incubators and public pitch events. So you may say this rule against advertising against general solicitation has been observed in the breach more than the observance, but. The Jobs Act caught up with that. Uh, what Congress decided was, uh, you know, instead of uh, the SEC just kind of sitting on this perennial proposal, Congress decided to take it and just put it right in the Jobs Act. So, so in 2012, uh, the law was changed to say, uh, as long as you're just selling to accredited investors, angel investors, uh, it doesn't matter whether you generally solicit or generally advertise. And Congress told the SEC to within 90 days issue rules to implement that uh, that mandate now it's taken over a year they didn't uh, the sec didn't make the 90 day um, uh, mandate but um, the sec has lifted the ban on general solicitation uh, a lot of people in the startup community are are happy about this thinking that the problem has been solved but you know, this is the way I guess legislation and regulation happens. Where in Washington D.C., everything's constantly being retraded, whether it's uh, Obamacare or the Patriot Act or any other number of things. Here in this level, the debate's happening again because although Congress said lift the ban on general solicitation, the SEC a year later did issue rules to do that. On the same day, the SEC issued new rules saying. Because generally solicited offerings are so different in character from ones that aren't, 
we're concerned about the information that's getting disseminated. We're concerned whether there'll be more fraud. So they're imposing, they're proposing to impose new rules to say that um, if you generally solicit, you're going to have to file all the information you use in solicitations with the SEC no later than the first day you put those into play. They're, they're proposing to change all the filing requirements so that you have to pre-file uh, your Form D in advance rather than after the fact. Uh, and they're, impo they're imposing new penalties and teeth to the filing requirements. So it really would overhaul um, um, the way startups raise money with a lot of new requirements add a lot of legal complexity and expense. And uh, it, it seems to a lot, a lot of us that practice in the area, it's kind of Congress's move is kind of backfiring. We may, we've gotten general solicitation, but we're going to also possibly have a lot more legal complexity. So you, you start to wonder whether the, the change in the law was, uh, was worth it. Goodness, that's not good to hear. Um, do you see any hope on the horizon here, or is this just how it's going to pan out? I think there's hope on the horizon. The fact of the matter is the, the, the lifting of the ban on general solicitation has taken place. Those rules are now final. They'll become effective on September 23rd. The new rules being proposed still have to go through a rulemaking process. And I do think the SEC does listen to comments. Uh, that's been very clear as I followed uh, policy uh, in, in matters impacting angel financing and, and startup and, and emerging companies over the last five years. The, they do listen to comments and often the, uh, uh, the, the comments are, they don't include voices from uh, startup technology companies. They always include voices from banks and from Wall Street and, 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 and big financial interests and hedge funds. They, have, they write a lot of letters. But uh, I think if people comment and say, you know, we don't need a Sarbanes-Oxley for startups, the, the new compliance regime – uh, for information requirements and filing requirements and multiple filing requirements, maybe for a hedge fund that's advertising, um, that compliance cost is 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 not significant. And but for um, you know a startup company that might just be raising a couple hundred thousand dollars in a in a seed financing, it doesn't make sense to have you know twenty or thirty thousand dollars in 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 compliance costs that that uh, that weren't there before. So I think the, the comment process. Will, will help. Um, and, uh, and I think there are probably some people in Congress that are looking about whether, you know, is the SEC kind of trying to retrade uh, uh, the, the, uh, the policy decision that Congress has made? To be fair, uh, the SEC is in a tough spot because they've got the state regulators, you know, at, at them worrying about uh, scams and fraud and, you know, what might happen uh, if, uh, if the, the latest startup deal is, you know, advertised as the hottest thing and you need to get in it. Um, but again, if the, if, the ish, if the investors at the end of the day have to be accredited investors, uh, you wonder why it matters uh, that there's advertising at all if, if, the, if at the back end you've got that policy protection. By the way, I haven't put this on the table yet, but it's important. One of the quid pro quos, and this was something that happened at the congressional level. It, it's not something the SEC added by fiat. Um, uh, if you're going to engage in general solicitation and advertise your startup offering, then you do have to take um, uh, what the rule calls reasonable steps to verify that your investors are accredited. In in today's world, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but in today's world, the investors essentially self-certify. They might fill out a questionnaire, but at the end of the day, they give a they basically give a rep and warranty in the subscription document that they're accredited. The the issuer can rely on that in good faith. Under this new rule, new version of the rule, uh, that won't be enough. Um, um, the uh, the company's going to have to ask for income tax returns or balance statements, even do a credit report on investors to verify their accredited stat, uh, status. That's got a lot of investors um, uh, up in arms in terms of uh, the privacy issues and privacy concerns, not just of revealing that kind of personal information to, to young companies, but also uh, on the company side, you know, what kind of document retention and personally identifiable information control policies do tiny companies, you know, have, they probably don't have them. So yeah, answer uh, not much. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so one of the one of the one of the um, other aspects of this that's kind of a, maybe a failsafe for all of us is the old set of rules, uh, which is now known as 506B. If anybody wants to sort of take notes and know the nomenclature, the old set of rules, the old 506 rule is now called 506B. The new one allowing uh, advertising is called 506C, and the two are going to run in parallel. And, 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 and the old rules, if you want to not engage in advertising and have the, all these old new rules to, 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 to comply with, you can stay in the old world. But here's, the, here's an irony of that. As the 506C comes online uh, and you're thinking, I don't like that. I want to stay with the old rule. A lot of behavior that we're engaging in today was really on the edge of old 506 anyway and now that you've got a new rule that talks about what you have to do when you advertise a lot of current activity uh like say a, like a maybe a, a a tech crunch disrupt public event you know arguably ought to have been in that advertising world and maybe going forward will be in that advertising world and i bet you state regulators are going to say a lot of current industry practice is really in this 506c world anyway so it's a lot a lot of turmoil right now but but the final rules haven't been written on on some of these things that have been proposed and there's still time to impact um um if you if you're if you're in a startup uh, um company and you're or you're a serial entrepreneur and you're worried about this kind of thing there is an information site that i and others have put up called uh, savedregd.org s-a-v-e-r-e-g D dot org and um, and you know, that's just meant to be an information resource for people that want to read up on this and 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 look into what they might be able to do. I do think if people want to leave comments, they will be read. That's awesome. Thanks for all that great information, Bill. And uh, we'll continue to watch the situation as the Jobs Act doesn't seem to be exactly what we thought it was going to be coming out of the gate. Uh, let's move on to our tip and resource of the week. Our tip is actually right in keeping with what you were just saying, Bill, that people uh, may not interpret their current social media or public activity uh, in ways that could have legal ramifications down the road. Uh, there was a survey done, you know, one of those annoying surveys where they call you up at dinner time and say, hey, would you participate in our survey? And some people say yes, rather than just slamming down the phone. Um, a survey done by lawyers.com that asked if social media users believe that what they can post can be held against them in a court. So our tip from all of this is to let people know, because they don't seem to get it, that yes, indeed, what you do on Twitter and other social media sites is completely public if that's what you know the filter setting for your content is. And on Twitter, unless it's a DM, everything is public. Less than half of people believed that uh, those sorts of things could be used against them in a court of law. 46% of Facebook users, 44% of YouTube users, 38% of Twitter users, 32% of Instagram users, and only 25% of Vine users. So the sophistication seems to be going down as we go down the continuum from Facebook to Vine. Uh, that was true too. They looked at things like education and income and the more educated and the more you made, the more you were likely to get that, yes, these things are public and have ramifications for, potentially in court and uh, the less educated, less income, the less people appreciated that. Younger people too got it better than older people. People That was a surprise to me in this survey is, you know, you would think um, old people have been knocking around and know that uh, their words can come back <laughs> to bite them, but not so much. Uh, and along those lines too, um, a funny story highlighted over a Boing Boing uh, from the police of Scotland. Uh, this involved a debate between a Labour member of parliament, Stella Creasy, and an author and uh, columnist. They debated on TV and the police of Scotland uh, tweeted out that the uh, writer and columnist had made a right tit of it. Um, I'm not sure my, you know, UK dialect or Scottish dialect is not good enough to, I think that's an insult. But the rather um, interesting thing about saying that this fellow, 
the writer and columnist made right t- of it is because he himself had gotten in trouble uh, before for tweeting uh, that he was watching some member of parliament and right behind that person was someone with quite a bit of cleavage. And he noted that on Twitter and wondered who it was right behind. So, uh, you know, if people just don't seem to get that these social media things can um, come back and bite them, but they do. So our tip is it's really, really public yet again. Uh, Our resources this week are twofold and they're good. Um, One is the, uh, it's called, do, 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 do. One second here. I lost my place. Cast browser. Uh, It's called Chrome. It's not, it's Google cast. Cast? Yes. It's Google cast. That is the uh, browser extension for the Chromecast device that we discussed last week. Uh, The little $35 device from Google. Uh, you want the Google Cast extension because with that, you are giving lots of leverage to people like CBS. Um, Even if you're not using something like Netflix or uh, YouTube, which has already um, built in a a little button at the top that will automatically cast something if you're using that app. If you're using the Google Cast browser extension, anything you can watch in a browser tab, including CBS programming, should it go off the air, uh, can be cast or slung to your uh, TV using the Chromecast device. So um, check out the Google Cast browser extension if you're interested in watching web content on your TV. And then finally, in honor of having Steve on the show, we have a resource uh, from I Am Wakeful at Midnight is the site. And the article is Legal Writing with 89% More Snark. And uh, so it's sort of clandestine legal snarky writing. If you don't want to just come right out with it the way that Steve did, uh, how you can be a little bit more snarky in your legal writing in a sneaky way, in ways that lawyers often do. It doesn't have to be legal writing either. Uh, Non-lawyers might not be familiar with sick putting sick after something that uh, someone else has written written that you're quoting where they made a mistake and you want to point it out. When you put sick in rather than correcting them, you're pointing out what a buffoon they were when they originally wrote this. And as the author of this piece said, sick is snarkiness masquerading as a necessary citation. Um, he also pointed out, and I love this, that when you're quoting something Uh, a short quotation. Um, Most often when we do long quotations in legal documents, we do a big block quote. So there's no need to use quotation marks. But oftentimes when you're using quotation marks, it's the written equivalent of using air quotes. I thought that was beautiful (laughs) because you're calling out uh, how ridiculous the thing is that you're quoting. So if, for example, plaintiff's emergency motion for relief when you put emergency in quotes. Um, all kinds of good tips about adding snark to your writing with apologies to Bill McAvoy on HBO's uh, The Newsroom Show who is on a campaign for civility. I am all for civility, but I'm all for a little bit of snark from time to t- time too. It entertains us all. Uh, Evan, uh, I know that we are as civil as we can possibly be while still having fun on this show. And it's uh, been great to do another one with you. Yeah, for sure. I've really, really enjoyed it. And if you could indulge me for just uh, 30 seconds here, I'd like to introduce a topic for uh, discussion. This, you know, maybe not something we can resolve here, but I've been feeling a little bit of uneasiness lately. This is a legal writing point. So it tacks onto what we were talking about here. Um, the, The verb phrase, enter into. You see this in the preamble of a lot of contracts, for example, and it, it actually, believe it or not, is in the King James Bible, in the book of Hebrews, for example. They talk about enter, entering into God's rest. But to me, that just bugs me to no end. And I'm wondering if uh, it's time for us to be conscious in this modern age of just instead of saying enter into because it's redundant, we just say enter so I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that. And if there's anybody out there uh, in IRC or listeners or viewers who uh, have any con, uh, you know, opinion on that, because enter into has been in the, the English lexicon for a long, long time. But I think it's time to be uh, telescoped and, and compressed into just saying enter, because that's what we're uh, really saying. So thanks for letting me uh, you know, put that out there. I'd, I'd be happy to hear what people's uh, insight, uh, you know, I'd like to enter into a dialogue with people about that. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yes. I am all for making writing as succinct as possible. So yes, let's do away with into. We are anti into here on the show. 
Uh, but very pro our panel who have uh, taken great time and uh, thought and great contributions to our show today. Steve Caplet, wonderful to get to talk to you in person. Thank you for contributing to the great body of work that is uh, snarky legal writing that makes people laugh and also accomplishes a goal. Uh, we really have enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And I, I, I want to state for the record, I strongly resisted any urge to use sick in my letter. And I just want <laughs> everyone to acknowledge that. Um, yes, your client, that your was client very did it really, of you. Your client did it really well uh, in his you know, spoken remarks at the town council meeting talking about confustion. I loved how they made that a, a theme. <laughs> well, so that, that was... I, that yeah, yeah, that's that's things. why I resisted it. And by and by the way, if you haven't looked at it, some of the funniest stuff were the comments uh, on his uh, website after this all happened. People from all over the country were showing up having fun, and someone wrote, "Hey, I came here looking to buy oranges. Where are they? I'm so confusted." So uh, <laughs> pe people had a lot of fun with his website. But uh, Denise, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed this, and uh, and it was a pleasure being here. Great having you. And Bill, thanks so much for joining us again. Wonderful checking in with you. Yeah, same here. A real, a real pleasure. I've been looking forward to it all week and, and, and it's been a blast. Thanks. If anyone's interested in learning more about the things we've discussed on today's show, check out our public list of discussion points at delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 222. Yes, this is our Room 22 uh, edition of This Week in Law. Uh, if you're old enough to remember Room 22, my hat is off to you because I grew up on uh, that and other Friday entertainment in the 70s, including the Brady Bunch, Partridge Family, then came Room 22, The Odd Couple, and of course, the oh so racy love American style at 10 o'clock. I hardly ever got to stay up for that one. But uh, it, our 222nd episode made me remember William Constantine and Karen Valentine. And so for all you uh, folks of a certain age, I hope you um, also have a moment of nostalgia over that. Uh, so do check out our discussion points if you missed anything on the show or want to do further research. You can also, of course, find our entire archive of shows at twit.tv slash twill and at youtube.com slash thisweekinlaw. We love to hear from you between the shows. It's how we know what you want us to talk about. So uh, do hit us up on Twitter. I'm D Howell there. Evan is internet cases there. Or head on over to our Google Plus page or our Facebook page. We'd love to chat with you there too. Uh, until next time, this has been This Week in Law and a ton of fun. See you next time. Bye.